The book of Exodus this evening is a fascinating book of the Bible. Moses is the central theme character along with Aaron and some of the others. But as I've shared with you before, before we dive into this chapter, I want to just kind of recap briefly of the book of Exodus. We know that the book of Exodus is summarized into two different sections. Section number one is between chapters 1 and 18, and it's about the redemption of God's people from the land of Egypt. And as the people of Israel left Egypt, they began to journey in the wilderness. And so the second portion of the book of Exodus is dedicated to the people at Sinai through chapters 19 through 40. We find that the people of Israel should have taken them about 11 days on their journey from the land of Egypt to the land of Canaan, and it took them about 40 years. And as they were trying to go into Pharaoh, as you know the story, Moses and Aaron were called by God to march into Pharaoh's palace and say, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. So they can go three days journey in the wilderness and serve the Lord and worship him there. As you know the story, as God called Moses and Aaron to do that, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And in chapter Number seven, we discussed how all the water was turned to blood, attacking the god of the Nile that the Egyptians worshipped. Last week, we looked in Exodus chapter 8, where the frogs plagued the land of Egypt, where the lice and the swarms of flies plagued the land of Egypt, all as a result of God's judgment upon the people of Egypt. And they still continually refused to allow the people of God to leave the land of Egypt. Four times so far out of ten, God sent plagues. And this evening we're going to look at three more of them. We're going to look at the, at the slaying of the cattle, at the boils, and the hail that was rained down from heaven. Today I just want to share with you my sermon title. It's the same title as last week, but it's just called part two. There is no God like our God. There is no God like our God. If you remember anything from these next few chapters, I want you to remember this thought. There is no God like our God, and His name is Jesus Christ. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the ending. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the great I Am who was and who is and forever will be. His name is Jesus and he is not just the king of heaven, he's also the king of my heart. And if he's not the king of your heart this evening, then you need to make sure he's that before it's eternally too late. Today I want to share, you, share with you a key statement. It's the same key statement as last week. And you know the old rule of thumb, repetition is the key to retention. And the mother of all learning is repetition. So, I share with you again. Hearkening not to God's word produces a hardening towards God's Word. Hearkening not to God's Word produces a hardening towards God's Word. And that is exactly what we see in the life of Pharaoh. The past few chapters, well, earlier in the book of Exodus, we saw a prediction that God was predicting that Pharaoh's heart was going to be hardened because he did not want to hearken to the voice of God. And as we've studied so far, we find that Pharaoh's heart was hardened towards the word of God. And as a result, God sent down his judgments. These individuals were polytheistic. They believed in many different gods. And it is amazing, as I've been studying these chapters in the Old Testament, that not much has changed in a few thousand years in the cultures of the, of the world. We find it strange that they would have a goddess that had a head of a frog, and they would bow down and they would worship that God. How ridiculous and foolish that is. But my dear friends, there's people all over this world who bow down to just as crazy gods that they've made with their own mortal hands. But the God that we serve was never made by mortal hands. In fact, the mortal hands that we have were made by God Himself. He is the one who spoke the world into existence. He is the creator of this world. And he created you and me in his own image. And that's why we should give him our lives. But as we come to this chapter, we find these three plagues that God thunders down. And, and as we've noted earlier, that each of these plagues was a direct response of their polytheistic mentality of worshiping all these false gods. God is making a clear statement that there is no other God in the heavens. 
that needs to be worshipped besides Him. Nobody compares to Him. And as we come to the first seven verses this evening, I want to share with you this thought. Now, the outline this evening is not meant to be funny. I'm just responding the exact way that's mentioned here in the Word of God. Hearken to God's Word because He is greater than cows. Hearken to God's Word because He is greater than cows. So I asked the key question, why should we hearken to God's Word? Well, first of all this evening, hearken to God's Word because He is greater than cows. And you say, why in the world is God sending out a judgment upon the cattle of the land that they own? Well, believe it or not, my dear friends, you, you, you might find this crazy, but as I was studying this particular section of Scripture, not only did they have a goddess and a god that they worshipped that had a head of a frog, how disgusting and crazy that is, but they also had, had a cattle's head. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if, if a statue is made with a cow's head and somebody told me that I had to bow down and worship that, ca that, that cow's head, I would look at them like they were crazy and from the planet Mars and tell them, you've done lost your everlasting mind, and you need to get right with God. And I think about how not much has changed in 3,000 years, because there are cultures, believe it or not, who ascribe great value to cows and cattle. You say, well, well, how about a for instance, Mr. throughout India, and it is creeping into our culture today as we've been out door knocking. I met plenty of Hindus and Buddhists, but the Hindus, you know what they do? They set up laws in their country forbidding people to eat beef. Why do they do that? Because they ascribe worth to cows. And it's not in a sense, I was reading an article about Hinduism, and it says that we do not worship cows. We give reverence to the cows. <laughs> you know, it's like when people tell, come to me and say, well, I'm a Catholic, but listen, I don't pray to Mary. I talk to Mary to talk to Jesus. How crazy is that? You are praying to Mary if you're bowing your head and uttering up a prayer to Mary. And people who give reverence to cows, you know what they're doing? They are giving worshipful mindset to cows. Now, I'm here to tell you something. You have the liberty from Almighty God to eat beef unless you have a... A medical issue that prevents you from doing that, you can have as much beef as you would like. Now, as a footnote here, be sure to consult your medical professional uh, before doing so. <laughs> but I'm here to remind you that these individuals worship the goddess called Hathor. And this goddess literally had a cow head. They worshiped a god named Apis, the bull god, and it was a symbol of fertility. Here we find that in verses 1 through 7, God commanded no Moses to go into Pharaoh's palace and say, let my people go. By the way, verse number 1 of chapter 9 is the fifth time Moses and Aaron walk into that area and say, let my people go. And if you do not do it, in verse number 3, he said, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field. He said, upon horses, upon the asses or the donkeys, upon the camels, upon the oxen, upon the sheep, all of those will die. And verse 4 says, the Lord shall sever. In other words, he's going to make a difference between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of the Egyptians. As you know, as you've read it, as we've read it before, that when God sent down the plague, the cattle of Egypt died. But the cattle in Goshen, an area where the Hebrews were located in their camps, none of their cattle died. It is amazing. As I read these judgments, how when God pours out his judgment and wrath upon the world for their disobedience through their rebelliousness and, and sinfulness and their refusal to get things right with God and repent, God always protects his children. And today as I read these verses, as I read these chapters, I am continually reminded of Romans chapter 8 where it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Today, as a child of the living God, I don't have to worry about I don't have to fret about, I don't have to give any thought about ever spending eternity in hell because I am a child of the living God. I've been saved by His blood and washed accordingly, and now I am heaven bound, as the old preacher said, with a hammer down. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. And I hope you're the same. If you're not, you need to do so before it's eternally too late. Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that you could have that security. 
And that you, you, so you could escape the judgment of God in hell. Verse 5 says, the Lord appointed a set time. And by the way, you know what the writer of Hebrews said? He said, is it appointed on the man wants to die, but after this the judgment. I wonder, if you're here this evening and you died right now, would you be prepared to stand before God? The Bible does say, absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. If you died right now, would you be ready to meet the Lord face to face? Well, I confess there's plenty of Christians out there who are not ready. And there's every other believer underneath the sun who's surely not ready. Just as God had an appointed set time to thunder down the judgment upon the cattle, God has a set time prepared to not only bring his judgment upon this earth by fire, but to pour out his divine indignation upon all those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 6 says, And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, the very next day. All the cattle of Egypt died, but the cattle of the children of, Egypt, of, of Israel did not die. Verse 7, Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites did. And check out these words. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Hearkening not to God's word produces a hardening towards God's word. Why should we hearken to God's word? Well, first of all, hearken to God's word because he is greater than cows. But now I want to share with you from verses 8 through 12. Secondly, this evening of why we should hearken to God's word. Hearken to God's word because he is greater than boils. Hearken to God's word because he is greater than than boils. Look at verse 8. The Bible says, And the Lord said, this is the Lord God Jehovah speaking, the Lord said to Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace. Now, my parents' house, we had a wood stove. We didn't use it a whole lot. Thank God for that because I would have had a chore to cut all the firewood. And thank God I didn't have that every week to do. Already had enough chores to do of feeding the dog and mowing the grass and everything else. But Nonetheless, I was glad that we didn't have to do that, but we had one, and I thought it was very interesting. Whenever we put wood in the furnace and the, uh, the stove, what's over in the basement, it puts off an extreme amount of heat. And if you're not used to it, you would just you you could literally be thirty below. Uh, I mean, excuse me, thirty degrees under, like twenty five degrees or whatever. And you could open up your windows and your your doorway to your house, and it would feel fine with the heat that comes from those wood stoves. But what's interesting is the wood goes in there, the fire burns, and it turns the wood into ashes. And here, as we have this same concept in mind, Moses and Aaron have handfuls of ashes from the furnace that was burning with fire. And the Bible says that, that God says, let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. So there he goes, and he's just going to toss it up in the air, up into heaven towards Pharaoh. And the Bible says in verse number 9 that it shall become a small dust in all the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beasts throughout all the land of Egypt. Now let's pause right here. This is the plague of boils that the commentators have labeled it as. And, and these, these Egyptians, they worship a goddess. I'm not going to try to pronounce their name, but it was the goddess that had power over diseases. So God sends these boils. Imagine having painful ulcers all over your body that's where the term boils means is like an ulcer so if you could just imagine like like somebody taking ashes and throwing it in your body and the burning sensation of those coals and ashes coming on your skin and making those burning spots all over your body imagine the pain and agony well these guys they worship the goddess of disease and the pestilence God and the goddess of healing. They worship these different gods. And God was thundering down saying, hey, you can cry out to your false little gods all you want to, but they're not going to bring healing upon you. The only one that can bring healing, his name is called Jehovah Rapha. And that's me. I am the Lord that heals, God says. And today as we look in the New Testament, we find that the same God that could heal then, the same God that Jesus spoke, you know what he did? He gave sight to the blind. He gave hearing to the deaf he gave a voice to those who could not speak he gave arms to those who did not have arms he gave legs to those who could not walk 
He, to those who were crippled, he gave life. To those who were ill and diseased and sought physicians their entire lives, he brought healing to them. And today, you might be in a sickness battle, whether you're a mental sickness or a physical sickness or a spiritual sickness. God is the one that can heal. Don't go to uh, the psychic over across the road here on 220. Don't go to anybody else. Go to God. Don't go to the Mormon temple or the Mormon ward, ward, whatever they call them. Don't go to the kingdom hall. Don't go to the witch doctor in Africa or in your backyard. Go to Almighty God. He can bring healing. And verse 10 says, And they took the ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh. And Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil breaking forth with blains upon man, upon beasts. So not only did men get it, but all these cattle got it too. All these animals got it. Verse 11 says, The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. And here's an interesting verse right here. I want you to understand this. As I've studied each of these verses about Pharaoh's heart being hardened, you need to understand that Pharaoh has hardened his heart multiple times towards God and God's word. And so I believe that verse number 12, in correlation to all of these other verses about Pharaoh hardening his heart, is saying this. God is saying, hey, Pharaoh, you've hardened your heart. You want it to remain hardened? Well, I'm going to allow your heart to be hardened. And in verse 12, it says, The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and... He hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Hearken to God's word because he is greater than boils. Hearken to God's word because he is greater than cows. Listen, you can worship any crazy goddess of disease or, or uh, healing you want to. Listen, we're Americans. You worship whoever you want to. But don't make that God the true and living God. There's only one true and living God and his name is Jesus Christ. Let's look further in this passage. From verse 13 all the way down to verse 35, we're going to look at the third and final thought this evening, the third and final reason of why we need and why we should hearken to the voice of God and God's word. As I read verses 13 through 35, it, it's about the plague of hail. So I wrote down this, hearken to God's word because he is greater than hail. As you begin to study these verses and in, you try to study the historical context of the land of Egypt, you find that these people, they worshiped, the sky goddess, they literally call this God, I'm not even joking, they call this God nut, like N-U-T, like peanuts, just nut. And let me tell you something, if you worship the sky goddess called nut, you are a nut. <laughs> they worshiped Osiris, the god of crops and fertility. They worshiped Set, the god of storms. So as, he, as you look up to the sky, they would worship all the different stuff. I, can, I get it. I get it. If somebody is going to worship the moon and the sun and the constellations, I totally get that. But worshiping a cow and worshiping uh, diseases and, and worshiping hail, I don't get. So here, as God is thundering down saying, I am God, not your goddesses and gods. He is literally revealing that this hail is coming down and it is time to get things right or suffer through the wrath. Their hardening hearts brought God's indignation. You see, God always wants to spare his judgment. But if mankind continually hardens their heart towards God and his word, God's judgment will come. And I believe God's judgment will come to our nation unless we get things right with him. God's judgment will come to the young generation and to the older generation if they do not hearken to the word of God. For the sixth time, Moses and Aaron in verse 13, they go into Pharaoh's palace and they say, Let my people go that they may serve me. And in verse 14, the Bible says that I will, set at, I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. And there is none. God is God and there is none else. Never misunderstand that. Verse number 15 says, For now I will stretch out my hand that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence. And thou shalt be cut off from the earth, and in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up. Verse 16. Check it out. I like this verse. For to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. You see, God was making sure that they knew that all these gods and goddesses were false. 
and that he was the true and living God. You know what God has brought to declare his name into all the earth now? It's you and me. As New Testament believers, God has given us the commission to go into all the world and to declare that Jesus Christ died on Calvary for our sins, that he was buried in a borrowed tomb, that he rose victoriously, and that he offers eternal life to all those who receive his salvation. And that's why it's urgent. That's why it's important. That's why it's necessary that we live a lifestyle of evangelism. That every conversation we have, that, every, that everything we ever do points people to Jesus Christ. There is no greater joy in life than telling people about the name of Jesus. His name is greater than any athlete, any celebrity, any musician, any politician, any doctor. Anybody in this world that has ever lived does not compare to the glory and splendor of the name of Jesus Christ. That's why we need to hearken to him. Verse 17 says, As yet exaltest thou thyself against my people, that thou wilt not let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as has not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof until now. I'm sure you might have been driving down the road before, and a severe thunderstorm might come. And hail might come down. And it might be raining so hard that you have to pull over on the side of the road. Because you cannot see. We've all been there. We've all had to do it. We find that a very severe storm came to Egypt. That never happened before their history of a nation. Verse 19 says, Send therefore now, and gather thy cattle, and all that thou hast in the field. For upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field, and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. I mean, can you imagine? Hail, the size of a baseball, coming down from the sky and hitting you in your head. could kill you. And that's what's going on here. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. Verse 22 says, The Lord stretched out. He stretched forth his hand toward he heaven as he told Moses, or excuse me, he says to Moses, Moses, stretch forth thine hand toward heaven that there may be hail in the land of Egypt upon man and upon beast and upon every herb of the field throughout all the land. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and the fire ran along upon the ground. Uh, so this gives the idea that there's lightning being struck and when the lightning struck it would hit something and cause fire and fire would spread. And it says the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail. Very grievous such as there was not like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Verse 25, And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smote every herb of the field and break every tree of the field. Only the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous. And I and my people are wicked. Verse 28 says, Entreat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Now Paul's here. Verse 27 and 28 remind me how not much has changed throughout the course of mankind's existence. Mankind can be going through a rocky tribulation, and during that rocky tribulation, when they hit rock, the rock at the bottom is when they want to cry out to God. But as soon as they get back up and they get settled in life again, they walk away from the Word of God. Let me just say this today. May I, may I be as bold as I can be? May I, may, I, may I be very clear? But may I also be very courageous that there's been a many people that have prayed the sinner's prayer who are going to darken the gates of hell because they did not pray with a sincere heart and they never put their faith and trust in Christ. There's many people who have called out to God's servants and, and asked them to go and pray on behalf of them to the Lord, but they have never called on the name of Jesus Christ. Today, my dear friends, there are so many people in this world who want to go to God when they hit rock at the bottom, but they do not want to know the, who is the rock at the bottom, and his name is Jesus. It's interesting, you know, in the New Testament, we find that, that, in, the, that in the book of Exodus, that the, the rock was smitten and the water poured out. 
And in the New Testament, the Bible says that rock, you know who it was? It was Jesus Christ. And here we find that Pharaoh has finally come to a place where he realizes, I am a sinner, I am wicked, and God is righteous. And he says, go and treat, go pray on my behalf. And why does he do that? Not so that he can get things right with God, but so that the thundering and the lightnings and the hail and the fire will stop. That was his motive. And there's been a whole lot of people's motive who would go and pray to God so that bad things could stop happening to them. They, they get this message today, like you can hear from the televangelists. If you pray the sinner's prayer, God will send you a Rolls Royce tomorrow. If you pray the sinner's prayer, God will give you a $250 million acre of land. I mean, how crazy is that? But people believe it. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe that a Pharaoh would have done that then. He would have been saved. It's interesting how he acknowledged he was a sinner. He acknowledged that Jesus, that God Jehovah, or Jesus, was righteous. And that his entire nation was wicked. But he himself never called out to God. May I say this? Salvation is not something I can do for you. Salvation is something you have to do in your own. You have to call out to God from your own heart. It says if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not if I pray on your behalf. Not if I lead you through a prayer. Not if I do this and not if I do that, but if you call out to him. I like Moses' response. His response is not like most ministers today. He says, as soon as I am gone out of, thy, out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord. <laughs> In the, in the Hebrew, you know what that means? That means he wasn't a Baptist. Because <laughs> he lifted up his hands and spread them before the Lord. It says, And the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know how that the earth is the Lord's. But as for thee and thy servants, I know that ye, that ye or you will not yet fear the Lord God. You see, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if you want God's wisdom, if you want to know God, you've got to fear him. You have to honor, respect, and obey him. Pharaoh was not willing to do that. He thought he was greater than the God of the Hebrews. But he was not. Verse 31 says that the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was was bold, and it goes on to say, but the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. And Moses went out of the city for, from Pharaoh and spread abroad his hands unto the Lord, and the thunders and hail ceased, and the rain was not poured upon the earth. And when Pharaoh, check it out now, check it out now. Remember, just, just a few verses back, Pharaoh he says, I'm a, I'm a sinner, and I, the Lord is righteous, and my people are wicked. Go pray for me. And in verse number 34, the Bible says, Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken by Moses. There's plenty of Pharaohs out there today who are doing the exact same thing that Pharaoh did. And the message this evening is very simple. God is greater than every God that's ever been imagined or made by mortal hands. And it's time that we hearken to his word. Hearkening not to God's word produces a hardening towards God's word. I wonder, as we've been studying these plagues that we've been pouring out upon the land of Egypt, I wonder this evening... Are you hearkening to the voice of God or is your heart hardened to the voice of God? God is greater and there is no God like our God, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.